Well, good morning. I hope the weekend has been a wonderful weekend for you. Our family had a fantastic weekend. We are uh, always enjoying a weekend time, as I'm sure you guys are as well. We're also a little bittersweet for a bittersweet weekend for us this uh, weekend. Bailey uh, heads back to school tomorrow, and I know it's just down the street at Belmont, but just the fact of her not being in bed tomorrow night in our home, I'm, I'm struggling a little bit with that. But we had a great weekend. We had a great time just to be together, and we, we always laugh a lot. I hope you guys laugh a lot when you're with your family. Now, my family's probably laughing more at me. They probably would admit that to you. They actually admit that to me, but we, we do laugh a lot. And actually, that's how we're going to begin this morning. My jokes aren't very good, so I'm not even going to try to get away with the joke this morning, but we do need to laugh, and so I'm going to make it really simple for you. So when I count to three, I just need you to laugh, and I'm not going to have you think about it. We're just going to hit it right now. One, two, three, let's laugh. Come on, laugh. <laughs> That's pretty good. That's pretty good. Let's do it again. One, two, three, laugh. Come on, let's laugh. Doesn't it feel good to laugh? Even when you're forcing it, Joe Ponders, you're really trying to get a laugh out this morning, I know. You're a little tired, I know. Laughter is so good for the heart, doesn't it, doesn't it feel good? It, 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 it feels good. It, it actually, studies show it relieves tension. It can actually relieve pain and really can benefit those who struggle uh, with, interestingly, just a variety of, of challenges, health challenges. We also have this thing inside of us that you may or may not be uh, aware of, and I want to say it right, and it really makes sense when I see it and when I read about it. I did not know this was inside of us. It's simply called a mirror neuron. Have you heard of a mirror neuron before? So we have this chemical reaction inside of us that mirrors laughter when we see others or hear others laugh. We often mirror that just in mentioning something that's humorous or hearing someone laugh, studies show us that we have these neurons that kick in and that we mirror those, and it feels good. It feels really, really, really good to smile and to laugh, and what a great way to begin our day, particularly because today we are not talking about laughter. We're actually looking at the opposite of laughter, and it is the word mourn. Everyone say mourn. It's not a fun, go happy, feel good moment. When you hear or use the word mourn, it usually is associated with something that just doesn't feel good and doesn't sit well with us. Well, interestingly today, guys, in Scripture, we are going to see uh, that Jesus tells us that mourning, not laughter, actually brings about comfort. Did you know this? Scripture tells us this, that when we mourn properly, not laugh, not find ourselves caught up in a moment of something humorous, but actually a a state of mournfulness, that there is comfort that can follow this. It's really fascinating. We're going to talk about it. But first, we've got to welcome one another, and you're probably going to laugh as you do it and smile and hug somebody's neck. So stand up and say good morning, Donaldson first style, before you get settled. And then we're going to open the Word. We're going to have a great time in the Word this morning. I love seeing you. I love hearing you welcome one another. Will you repeat this after me? Today, I'm going to listen. Oh, come on. Today, I'm going to listen. And I'm going to pray. God help me. Laugh a little bit today. No, follow you today. Father, that's our prayer. We just pray this morning that you would do all that you desire as we welcome, as we laugh. Lord, now as we turn and open your word, we are so thankful for the richness of your word. And Lord, when we choose to apply it, Lord, we see and we're going to see today that there's a blessing that flows. We ask that you do what only you can do for your glory. And we give you this time, and all God's people said, amen. You guys grab a seat. You probably remember, if you've been with us the last couple of weeks, we're in Matthew 5, by the way, today, that we began this passage several weeks ago, looking at specifically a moment that happens when Jesus, his ministry has just, has really just been launched, and in the previous chapters, he's been baptized, and then he goes into the wilderness, and he's tested and really the official launch of his ministry begins with this very powerful passage in Matthew chapter 5. In the previous verses leading up to chapter 5, we see that, that Jesus is, well, he's called his first disciples. And then he begins just immediately at healing people and, and changing their lives. And then we see at the beginning of chapter 5 where Jesus sees this crowd of people. And he draws in his disciples and he begins this very powerful message that we're just walking through. We are in 
week three of a series we are calling Be Like Jesus. And guys, I got to tell you, it has been a challenging series for me already. If I have not introduced myself to you previously before, I want to say good morning. My name is Jeffrey. I'm one of the pastors here. Thank you for those of you joining us online. I'm really excited for where we are going in Scripture today and over the next few weeks. We see that this passage in chapter 5 is really, though there are a crowd of people we believe listening, this passage is really delivered by Jesus to some of his closest friends, to some of his closest followers, and he is preparing them. We talked about this several weeks ago. You remember what he's preparing them for? He's preparing them for the kingdom of heaven. He tells them throughout this passage, and we're going to see this today, that there is a reward that comes to those who live in a way that Jesus challenges us to live in this passage. And so the first rite this morning is really an important one for us as it relates to the reward, but equally the responsibility to get to the reward. Look at the screen. It says this, to receive the reward of eternal life. There's a radically different lifestyle, a radically different lifestyle that I am expected to live. And man, what what a radical word it is. We talked about that two weeks ago as well, that what Jesus challenged these followers to do then and what he is challenging us to do now is not easy. Radically different for those then and equally for us now in a world that says live for it today and it's your day, your moment, seize it, get all you want, all you desire, live as you please. We see Jesus calls us to a different way of living. And I I just want to remind you guys this morning, I know you know this, but being a Christ follower, it sure isn't easy. It's not easy to live this way. I should not expect that it would be easy to live this way. Really, when when challenges come our way, it, it should be as though we smile, though it's tough to go through, because we understand as a Christ follower in a broken world, things just aren't going to flow as we always desire. And things aren't going to go as we always desire. There is a responsibility upon us as Christ followers, a lifestyle much is required of us, and we're going to see that today. And typically, I think it's important just to note, typically when, when we read or see the word happiness in the Bible, you probably know this as well, it usually is centered around a, a moment or a thought process or idea of something delightful or something light or a state of being happy, obviously we're not going to see that today. And we're quickly going to see that Jesus has other intentions as it relates to living a life on point, being mournful. Look at chapter 5. We read uh, verse 3 last week, blessed are the poor in spirit for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. I want you to see verse 4. It's really this one verse we want to focus on today. Jesus speaking, blessed are those who mourn. There's that word mourn. Interestingly, look at what follows next, for they will be comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. It really is this interesting idea when you, when you think about what it is Jesus is saying and calling us to and the response that follows, because guys, you know this, Jesus is speaking of something that just goes against culture, and really not just culture, but our, our hearts often. When we think of mourning, we think of something less than good. We think of a moment of of sadness, and we think of something that is, well, less than comforting. But that's exactly what Jesus is saying, again, when he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. People who mourn do not typically associate comfort with a blessing or with blessedness. And this is because Jesus, listen to this, is contrasting the world's idea of blessedness. Listen, the world's idea of blessedness with true blessedness. And there's a difference. Jesus is contrasting the world's idea of what it means to be blessed with Jesus' way of finding true blessings. And we're really going to see this today. The word Jesus uses here for mourn, if you're writing, you may want to write this down, doesn't mean sadness. Though there's a, a, a different thought altogether in this idea to which Jesus refers. When Jesus uses the word mourn, he is simply talking of godly sorrow. And that's really important of godly sorrow, a brokenness, a a, a deep sorrow, one that that our Savior understands. And we're going to see that in Scripture in various places today where Jesus fully understood what it meant to be mournful. And so he challenges us. The call before us today is to be mournful. And the promise that follows that is that when 
we choose to be mournful, we will be comforted. So the obvious question is this, over what are we to mourn? Have you thought about this before? If you've read this passage, you probably have thought through this. You probably have an idea. If you've studied this, you you may know exactly where it is Jesus wants to take us. If it's the first time here for you, you may be warning, okay, what, what's the mourn about? But for, for all of us, I want you to know, so we're on the same page, that, well, when we talk about mournfulness, and when Jesus specifically uses the word mourn, and he talks of mourn in the terms of godly sorrow, it leads to the obvious question, okay, Jeffrey, what are we to be sorrowful over? Well, just ask yourself the question, what breaks God's heart? Just ask that question. What breaks the heart of God? Over what does God mourn? And it leads us to the obvious word. What is that word? It's the word sin. If you're writing, you should write that this morning. The answer is simple, but it's definitely not soothing. It's sin. Over what does God mourn? It is sin. So so what does it look like for us as it relates to sin, sin in the world, sin in our own lives? What does it look like for us to mourn, I want to give you a, th- a couple of thoughts some more this morning. And the first is this, number one. I am blessed when I mourn the sins of the crowds. I am blessed when I mourn the sins of the crowds. Remember, guys, Jesus, as a matter of fact, look at it. Don't just remember it. Remind yourself of it. Verse 1, Jesus begins all that he is about to do and say based upon what it is that he sees. Look at verse 1, chapter 5. It says, now when Jesus saw the crowds. So the stage is set, and we understand clearly where Jesus' eyes are, and upon where Jesus' heart rests, his focus in this moment is the crowd. It says Jesus sees the crowd. The very next thing he does is he walks up on this mountainside. He draws his disciples close to him. And he begins this challenge. Jesus sees the crowds. The first thing we read here are the crowds. And so Jesus is focused here on the crowds and in doing so gives us this powerful, powerful challenge that his heart focus in this moment, obviously, is to teach his disciples, but to do so based upon the crowds that are around. And I I tell you, as as I've thought through this passage, the the past couple of days in particular, and, and guys, even... This morning, I, I wrote this in my notes. You, you, you may want to write this. It, it just really speaks to my heart, and so it may connect with yours, that shouldn't our attention be on the crowds? And that's really where Jesus has taken me this week, to think about the crowds in my life, the people that I do life with. And I tell you, Jesus has placed this on my heart. And I even wrote a prayer earlier this week. It's a one-sentence prayer, and I want to give it to you this morning. Or this morning. And I wonder if you would be willing to begin praying this prayer along with me. And the prayer is this, Lord, give me godly sorrow for the crowds. And imagine if we all prayed this. Give me godly sorrow for the crowds. I was reminded as I was studying this passage, if you want to go to Luke with me quickly, if not, I'll just put it on the screen for you, of a very powerful passage. It's actually just just one sentence in Luke Luke chapter 19, where Jesus is coming into Jerusalem. You may recall this story. And in verse 41, it says that as he, speaking of Jesus, approached Jerusalem and he saw the city, it just says he wept over it. This moment here where Jesus, a very, very powerful moment. Jesus knows what what is to come and he's, he's entering into Jerusalem and we know that it would be soon where Jesus would go to the cross and die for, for every one of us. And it says that Jesus entering this city actually wept. And guys, it brought me, and embarrassingly, I'll admit, not to a place of weeping this week. But as I thought about this passage and the call for us to mourn and to specifically mourn the sins of the crowds, I have to ask myself, why don't I mourn more for the world? Not to be of the world, but for the people in the world, for the brokenness of our world. I can't, I can't say that as one of your pastors that, that this is something I do often, but I sure want to get there. And I think it begins why, with this prayer, which is why I gave you this one-sentence prayer this morning, Lord, give me godly sorrow 
for the crowds. Because listen, guys, I think if we get here, listen to this, if we can get here as it relates to our hearts, then action follows. We begin to pray differently. And we see the world differently. And maybe we talk differently. Maybe we love a little differently. And it's a powerful passage. I mean, it's one sentence the Lord has given us here. Blessed are those who mourn. They will be comforted. But there is so much in this passage. Who are the crowds? The crowds are the people all around us, guys. The crowds are in your life every day. You work with them. You live next door to them. You, you live with them. You do life with them. Every one of us, we have the crowds in our lives. And this approach is it's a very different approach than is standard in the world today, in a world that, again, says it's, it's all about me, not the ye, not anyone else. It's just, it's my way, my world, my moment. Let's go. Let's hit it. It's a different way of thinking as we look to the crowds as to what it is we are to do and how we are to respond and how we should love. And I want to give you this. When it comes to how we look at this, the world and the hurts of the world, and I tell you, I hurt and you hurt. This is a reality. And it's a tough one to see this morning, but it's so real. I hurt and you hurt because of sin. And I am impacted by your sin. And you are impacted by my sin. And when we come to terms with this and we realize the reality of this and and don't hang our heads heavy in that moment, but realize the opportunity we have to love differently, I think it changes the way we mourn for a world that needs us to mourn for them. And we look for creative ways to respond and to love on them. So I'm, ex- I'm so excited to be a part of this church. And a few boats we've had recently are positioning us to be able uh, to look in some ways financially we haven't been able to, at least since I arrived. And so I want to I thank you for that. We had a, a, a couple of really big boat, boats over the last month. And you guys have stepped up and said, yes, we want to turn our attention now for this season, uh, even more so than we've done in the past, to just being watchful and being more uh, engaging in the community. And we're, we're super excited to tell you that we've, we've started a relationship with Hickman Elementary that, that I, I'm not so sure we've had before. Or if we have, we haven't had it in a while. And Stephen went over and, and met with Hickman. Some of the, 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 the leaders over there actually hit quite a few schools over the last couple of weeks. But we're really excited about this one. And, and in a brief conversation that Stephen, our student pastor, our executive pastor, had with some of the leaders over at Hickman, they immediately started sharing with us some of their needs, a way that we can help the crowds, that we can reach out and love on them. And so they've said, hey, we need for pre-K through fourth grade, new shoes, undergarments. We, we just need to, to flood our kids with what they need to help them just get through the day. I mean, can you imagine some kids as, I believe it was the principal, am I saying that right, that shared this? Was it the principal? Am I getting that wrong? It was the principal. That some of the kids just don't even have underwear to wear. Guys, we can help them right now, not right now, don't, you probably didn't bring underwear with you to leave, but we can help them right now this week, and so we put this on here, guys, by next, by next Sunday, August 22nd, I, I just know you're going to show up because you always do, WMU is so big at this, they're, they're hitting it all the time and, and blessing in this community, and we're really just picking back on what they're already doing, but you see it here, guys, donations needed, pre-K through fourth grade, shoes, undergarments, we don't have exact shoe sizes, but I tell you, if you'll just go shop for some boy shoes or some girl shoes, and somewhere in that range of pre-K to fourth. I know some kids are smaller and bigger than others, and no two kids are the same size, but hey, just bring it, and bring it, and bring it this week, and keep bringing it, and we're so excited to be able to reach out to the crowds of Hickman Elementary and to love on them. I am blessed when I mourn. I am blessed when I mourn for the sins of the crowd. Secondly, I am blessed when I mourn the sins, this is so specific here, of the unsaved. I am blessed when I mourn the sins of of the unsaved. Listen again to the words of Jesus. You may want to read along with me, Matthew 5, verse 3. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We discussed last week that the poor in spirit are just those in need. And when we realize that we are in need, there's a blessing that comes from this. And our reward is heaven. We're all in need. There's not a one in the room not in need. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. In verse 4, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Now go to Luke chapter 4 if you're opening your Bible uh, with with me today, or we'll put it on the screen if you're following along in the app. Luke chapter 4, the words that we've we've just read in Matthew chapter 5 are very similar 
to the words Luke records that Jesus uses at the beginning of his ministry. This is Luke, Luke chapter 4. Jesus has, has gone and has been tested in the wilderness and really begins his ministry, the launch of his ministry. And these are the words through the lens of the writer Luke, one of Jesus' followers. And he says this, records the words of Jesus in, again, Luke chapter 4, verse 18. Listen to what Jesus says. The Spirit of the Lord is on me because he has anointed me. Listen to the terminology here. To proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to proclaim freedom for the prisoners in recovery of sight for the blind, to set the oppressed free, and to proclaim the year of the Lord's favor. These are actually words spoken, a prophecy. If you want to go with me, you can, to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter chapter 61, I believe it is. Isaiah 61. Jesus has just spoken. Yeah, Isaiah 61, verse 1, really a prophecy spoken of Jesus, it says in chapter 61 of Isaiah, verse 1, the Spirit of the Sovereign Lord is on me because the Lord has anointed me to proclaim good news to the poor. He has sent me to bind up the brokenhearted, to proclaim freedom for the captives, and to release from darkness for the prisoners. Guys, do you see this? That in in Isaiah, of course, spoken long before Jesus even walked planet earth, and then hear the words that Jesus uses in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, these words are so similar to the words we, we now read and hear Jesus using in Matthew 5 when he speaks of the poor. Matthew 5, verse 3, blessed are the poor in spirit. We know that those poor in spirit are those in need. Jesus just, just told us, or we just read the, the prophecy that Jesus would use speaking of people who are in need, of brokenhearted, listen to this, people who need freedom, people who are captive, people who need release from darkness and who are prisoners. Though the wording is not the same, the idea and thought and the mantra of the message is all the same. And that here we have Jesus at the beginning of his ministry, recorded in Luke and then now specifically here in Matthew 5, using these words of speaking of what it means, number one, to offer hope to the poor, and secondly, what it means not only to offer hope to the poor, but to release those who are in need, the oppressed, those broken, those living in darkness. Guys, this just really speaks to me about the focus of my heart and where it should be, and that we see this this thing throughout Scripture before Jesus even walked the planet, and then in Matthew 5, and then in Luke 4, of this man who would come and change the world, fully man, fully God, and whose heart focus would be to set people free. And to heal the hurts of those in need. And to point people out of sin and brokenness and darkness. And I ask myself again as I, as I turn the mirror to me, is, is this my focus? Would you ask yourself this morning? It's the heart of Jesus and we see it and we see this pattern. But is it your heart focus? Is it truly the focus of our hearts to be as Jesus is? And to live as Jesus calls us to live? in a way that actually mourns for these people, that isn't just sad over them, but has a a godly sorrow for them. Hey, guys, I I have to tell you, I'm I'm not so sure that Christians today are radically jazzed about reaching the lost. I don't want to make a judgment call here, and it's, it's no call upon any one person, but more so just on Christianity as a whole. I mean... I would hope that I'm wrong, but I'm not so sure that we're we're radically jazzed about mourning the lost. And I I say that based upon actions. I mean, I, I think about conversations we've had here, and I'm the one leading the way in our conversations. And you know, we've talked a lot about aesthetics, and we've we've talked a lot about programming. We we've talked a lot about flow of service. We've talked a lot about rebuilding life groups and meeting in community on campus and home groups, meeting in community off campus. And of course, we all desire to see people saved and set free from sin. Amen, church? But I'm not so sure that it's the guiding point of everything we do. Yet we are here to meet as a church and to build up and to encourage and to support one another. But why are we to be here to meet 
and to build up and encourage one another. Not so that we stay here, but so then that we turn and we go out the doors and we go to the crowds. And we share love to the crowds. We pray for the crowds. And we're willing to lose our, our name for the crowds. Man, I sure want to be broken over this. I want to be better at this. Here's a prayer also I want to give you this morning, and I hope that you'll consider praying this one. Lord, give me godly sorrow specifically for the unsaved. Give me godly sorrow specifically for the unsaved. And I would say this if you're praying, and I know many of you are prayer warriors, that you would piggyback on that passage, that that the Lord would specifically show us how to be creative in reaching the saved here on our campus. I'll tell you, there's two events I'm really excited about, uh, again, because you voted and you're wanting us to, to turn inward for a while, and I'm, I'm super excited about this. We have two events coming up this fall, one in October uh, and one in November. The first is October 23rd, and we are calling it, as you see here, Fall at First Field. We are excited to be able to partner with Kroger. Kroger has just been super supportive of us, and we're having just really good conversations with them right now. Uh, but we're hoping to give away on October 23rd 200 pumpkins. We just want people to come on our campus, and we're going to have cornhole, and we're going to grill some burgers. Troy Charlton doesn't know it yet, but he's going to roast some hot dogs for us, and we're going to have some bonfires, and we're going to get going. I don't, yeah, three o'clock, there it is right there. We're probably going to end around nine or just however long it takes to give out pumpkins. But Kroger's donated half the pumpkins that we're wanting to give away. So when you're in Kroger, make sure you ask for a manager to just tell them thank you. They are donating half the pumpkins that we want to give away. And we just want people to come on our campus and we're going to get really creative and we would love your input on this out on the first field. Uh, we've been thinking about a name for that first field and we're wanting to, everything we do to drive people back to Donaldson first. I know we've called it Mission Field before and so we're hoping that's going to be all good with you guys. But if not, we'll change it back to Mission Field. But nonetheless, we're going to be on the field October 23rd. We'd love for you to be there. You're going to hear about it a lot because we need all hands on the field. Not on deck, but we need all hands on the field to just give out pumpkins to people that come on our campus. And as you see, here. We're really, really, really excited about this. This will be November, I think it's the 24th. No, it's the 21st. Mark it down now, November 24th. That's the Sunday before Thanksgiving. We hope to give away a whole bunch of turkeys. And so we're still praying about that number, but we're going to have worship here. And then we're going to eat a quick bite. And guys, we're going to head to the parking lot. And we're just believing and play, praying. So I hope you'll start believing and praying right now that people are just going to come. And we're going to give them a Thanksgiving meal that they can go home and they can prepare. And we're working with Kroger on this and Second Harvest Food Bank on getting a really good price point. And we're just going to give it away to people. And again, we're going to need all hands on the parking lot for this one. So these are two events we're really, really, really excited about to be the hands and feet of Jesus and to give them pumpkins and to give them turkey and to be who the crowds need us to be. Number one, we pray for the crowds and we pray for the unsaved. And let me give you another one. Number three, I am blessed when I mourn. Specifically, I am blessed when I mourn the sins of my life. I am blessed when I mourn the sins of my life. Above all, I believe, guys, this is the true blessedness to which Jesus refers, to be mournful, for me to be mournful, to you to be mournful over our sins. You know, in Ecclesiastes, a very popular passage, chapter 3, very, very, very wise man who walked the planet many years ago, he wrote this about segments of time and the seasons of life. And it's recorded in Ecclesiastes chapter 3, verse 1. It says this, there's a time for everything. And a season for every activity under the heavens. A time to be born and a time to die, a time to plant and a time to uproot, a time to kill and a time to heal, a time to tear down and a time to build, a time to weep and a time to laugh, a time to mourn and a time to dance, a time to scatter stones and a time to gather them, a time to embrace, a time to refrain from embracing. A time to search and a time to give up and a time to keep and a time to throw away. And he goes on and on and on. A time to tear or tear and a time to mend, a time to be silent, a time to speak, to love and to hate and a time for war and a time for peace. I sure hope we study Ecclesiastes at some point. I love the wisdom and the the life challenge here and just all that Solomon brings to the table when when he talks. And, you know, as you read this passage here in chapter 3, 
as I've just shared with you, you see that, that Solomon is speaking in, in segments. He is speaking in a time, a season, and then it passes. But what Jesus is sharing with us, go to Matthew 5 again, isn't a challenge for a segment of our life. No, it's, it's an all-encompassing, not here and then gone season. It's a, it's, a, it's a continual life approach to be mournful. When he says, blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. He's not speaking in a segment of, of time. He's not speaking in a one and done, and then you're done. No, he is challenging us, calling us to be broken to a godly sorrow over our sins. So, guys, how do, we, how do we mourn our sins? Let me give you four words as we end this morning. The first is this. We just recognize. We recognize the reality of our life. True mourning begins with the recognition that I am a sinner. Psalm 32, verse 5. Look at what Psalm 32, verse 5 says. It says, Then I acknowledge my sin to you. I did not cover my iniquity. And I said, I will confess my transgressions to the Lord, and you forgave the guilt of my sin. Psalm 106, verse 6, really continues in this. It says, we have sinned, even as our ancestors did. We have done wrong, and we have acted wickedly. True mourning begins with the recognition that I'm a sinner, and that no one, listen, no one gets a pass on this. I am a sinner. And my sins should disgust me. Does your sin disgust you? My sins should disgust me. I should be completely disgusted with the things that I do. It should leave me speechless at times. It absolutely should remind me that I have offended the very God who made me. It's not something passive. It's not just a part of life because I'm fallen. It's the reason I am fallen. And to mourn my sin properly requires of me a recognition When I mourn, I give recognition to the reality. I am the reason Jesus, though innocent, died as one who was guilty. Look at that statement. I'm the reason an innocent person died. And didn't just die, but died as one who was guilty. Recognition. Secondly, refuse. That I recognize the sinfulness of my life. And then I also refuse to keep sinning. Look at James 4. This is verse 17 of the book of James. It says this, If anyone then knows the good they ought to do and doesn't do it, it is sin for them. That's a pretty powerful passage. It is sin for them. 1 John chapter 1, verse 10 says, If we claim that we have not sinned, then we make him, Jesus, out to be a liar. And his word isn't in us. If we buy the lie that sin's no big deal, and if we specifically buy the lie that we haven't sinned, we are calling Jesus the Savior of the world. A liar. We are calling him a liar. We recognize, we refuse. Let me give you another word, really an important one, but not necessarily a popular one. Repent. We recognize the reality, the brutalness of our sins. We refuse to continue making excuses. We say no more excuses, and then we turn the course. That's what repent means. 1 John 1, 9. One verse just removed from the verse that we just looked at. 1 John 1, 9 says this, if we'll confess our sins, he is faithful, and he is just and will forgive us of our sins and purify us from all unrighteousness. Look at 2 Corinthians 7. This is verse 10. It says, godly sorrow, godly sorrow brings repentance. Godly sorrow. That is mourning. Mourning is godly sorrow. Godly sorrow brings repentance that leads to salvation and leaves no regret. And leaves no regret. Hey, if you're writing, you should write this this morning. Though my sin should disgust me, it no longer has to define me. It should disgust me. But it doesn't have to define me. And what a powerful sentence. It should disgust me. Let's hang on that for a moment, but it doesn't have to define me. And because of Jesus, it doesn't define me. And so here's another important right. A mournful heart is one that can humbly say, I am sorry for my sins. 
A mournful heart is just one who can humbly say, I'm sorry. Specifically sorry for my sins. We recognize, we refuse, we repent. And there is a really important word in the process. We just continue to hit repeat. We recognize, we refuse, we repent, we hit repeat. We recognize, we refuse, we repent, we hit repeat. Proverbs 28, verse 13. It says, whoever conceals their sin does not prosper. But the one who confesses and renounces, that's where mercy is found. Isn't that really good? When we confess, mercy is on the other side of that confession because Jesus is just such a God of mercy. Blessedness, guys, is not found in worldly success. It's not found in personal ambition or in acclaim. It's not found in setting a goal and in prospering by defined by the world. Instead, as Jesus states, true blessedness comes to those who are broken, to those who mourn over their sin. And what's our reward? What's the reward? It's in verse 4. When we mourn, look at the the reward. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be what? They will be comforted. There's a reward when we choose to mourn, when we are broken over the world, over the sins of the world, specifically over our own sins. There is a reward that follows. Because listen, guys, in mourning, I realize that I am in need. That's what, that's what verse 3 is about. We looked at that and unpacked it last week. And if you missed that, all the messages are at donaldsonfirst.com. They're all archived there for you. Just hit the word watch, the watch tab. And all of our messages over the last year, they're all there. Specifically last week, we talked about the idea of mourning and specifically mourning as it relates to being poor in spirit and realizing I am in need. When I mourn, I realize I'm in need because I am in need. This is really important. Because I am in need, I can find comfort in Jesus. When I am honest with my own sins, when I don't try to to gloss it over or skip past it or think God will just forget the distance that I get from the sin to now. No, when we stop buying that lie, when we get honest about who we are and humbly enough to ask for forgiveness, there's comfort waiting. There is comfort waiting. I can receive comfort I put this in my notes two days ago, and I haven't stopped looking at this one. I want you to see this one. I can receive comfort because I know my sin has been paid for by the great comforter. That's what the cross is all about. That's what Jesus did. That's what he did for you. That's what he did for me, and that's where true comfort comes from, the cross, the Savior who died guilty but was clean for you and for me. Guys, listen, you know this, the world turns to so many things for comfort. A drink, a drug, sex, porn, a hit, money, the right drive, the right car, the right neighborhood, the right size checking account, a Wall Street acclaim, and on and on and on and fill in the blank. But none of these things, you know this, none of these things will last. None of these things will last because none of these things were made to last to bring us comfort. None of these things were made to last to bring us comfort. I remember... A couple of years ago, I was on the road preaching somewhere. I, I almost, if I'm remembering correctly, believe this was in Nebraska. And I met a teenage girl. She gave her heart to the Lord at one of our events. And so she uh, wanted to speak with me afterwards. And so I was, I, I, I can close my eyes and I can remember, not exactly the town, obviously, but I remember the moment. And I remember standing there uh, in the lobby and she shares her story with me. And a counselor brought her to me and said, this girl just gave her heart to the Lord. And so I'm celebrating with her. And as she's very animated. And so as, as she's talking, her, her sleeves on her, on her body are moving. And I'm seeing cut marks on, on her, her wrist. And so I asked her about them. I said, are you, are you a cutter? And she, she dropped her head. I said, no, don't, don't drop your head. Just, I'm just curious, are you a cutter? And she said, yeah, I'm, I'm a cutter. And I said, why do you cut? And she says, well, it makes me feel good. I, I, I can't believe I've never forgotten this, at least until now I haven't forgotten it. She said, it just, it makes me feel good. I said, well, does it last? She said, what do you mean? I said, does it feel good last? And she says, well, eventually, no. And I said, and that's why you keep cutting, right? And she said, yeah. And for those who don't cut, it's, it's this perplexing, challenging 
dysfunctional, twisted way that, that people find release by inflicting pain when dealing with pain and the flow of the blood. And that's another conversation. But obviously, here's a girl who found Jesus and started a new life. But I reminded her that there were going to be moments ahead where it's going to feel like the decision you've made here didn't go home with you because life's messy and things get tough and you're going to hurt again. And I remember telling her that the, the cup will never work because it was never intended to work. But Jesus, the great comforter, can be the comfort that goes much deeper than one cut. And guys, that's what I want to leave you with this morning, just the reminder of the countless cuts the world offers us that just will never satisfy. We'll never, will never, will never be enough. The world can never offer complete comfort. Only Jesus can. Amen? Will you bow your heads with me this morning? We end with this simple but profound reality. And that is that Jesus truly is the great comforter. And so because he is the great comforter, we, we have nothing to fear. We don't have to fear the morning. We can welcome the morning. Morning brings blessedness morning can bring comfort because Jesus truly is comfort will you just rest in this for a moment just with your head bowed and your eyes closed just the truth that Jesus is comfort and I wonder as you're, as you're thinking through this as your mind is on these four words, Jesus truly is comfort. Would you ask yourself, is there an area in my life in which I am needing comfort? I would assume in a room this size and with 300 on average who watch us online that there are many in this moment who would say, yes, I need comfort. If that is you, will you just rest in the overwhelming grace that Jesus offers you in the midst of your hurt? Just rest in that this morning. Well, Jeffrey, I don't, I don't feel comforted, and my problem is still in the forefront of my mind. I, I get that. But I also know that what God says is true no matter what you're feeling because he is the great comforter. And I believe the more we lean into that, the better we get at dealing with the world and our own sins. And that we, though we were falling and though the world has fallen, truth still remains that Jesus is comfort. So lean into that this morning. If there be an area of your life that just needs addressing, you can lay that at his feet right now. If it's that you've never given your life to him, you can do that right now. If it's that there's this personal struggle, this sickness or addiction or financial challenge or brokenness over marriage or you fill in the blank, an area of your life that needs addressing, you can take that to him right now and just say, Jesus, I want to lay this at your feet. And I just want to give this to you. Just, just take a moment, just here in the silence, if you need to do that, just lay at the feet of Jesus whatever your need may be. In just a few seconds, I'm going to say a prayer and we're going to stand. And I'm going to be standing here at the front. And if you need to talk through something, pray through something, need to find someone in this room, I hope that you would just do what you need to do. I'm here at the front if you would like to talk or want more information about what it means to know the Lord or to join our church here or just to work through whatever it is you need to work through, our front is always open for an invitation for anyone who needs to do business with the Lord. But if comfort is what you need today, my prayer for you is that you find it at the foot of Jesus. Father, we thank you that your son loved us enough to die for us. 
And then in that one moment, he paid the price for every sin. And though you call us to be mournful of our sins, we can hang on the promise, the promise that there's comfort on the other side of mourning because Jesus paid the price for every sin on the cross, and we thank you for that. And Lord, I pray today that we find comfort in knowing that you're a good God and that you love us and that you're in it with us. This we ask in your name. Amen.